Welcome everyone, Bobby Lopez here, and we go to another in our series of webinars at QuickFixGolf.com, and tonight's a great one because we have a really good special guest that I'm very proud to bring to you tonight, Tony Miller, who's the owner of Raven Golf Clubs, and Tony was a past uh, designer for Wilson, and he knows what he's talking about. You're, you're going to get some information tonight that most golf club companies don't want you to know. I will tell you that right now. Shouldn't there be like an applause or something in the background? Okay, hold on. We got to come on right now. There you go. Hey, hey. First, I want to tell you what we do. Of course, we're uh, Quick Fix Golf, like and we golf give a comprehensive golf. golfing education, not like what Tony does. <laughs> 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 we're not only video analysis, we do how to play the game, course strategy, club selection, the mental aspects of the game, equipment, which we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, there's Jim Mason. Jim, how, how much weight have you lost? We got to get you a new picture. <laughs> About thirty-five pounds. You look fantastic. I tell you, Jim has done an unbelievable job. He's lost like thirty. I mean, thirty-five pounds. Yeah, I needed to. <laughs> Man, well, I tell you what, it looks good. I need to do the same thing, partner. And yeah, of course, uh, uh, Jim is a ping staff player. So, well, you, it just in uh, being fair, and and in here also is Pendleton Golf Club, where Jim hangs out. He's a director of golf there, and it's like playing in Scotland without the cost of the airfare. There's the wild Cuban. That's me yakking at you right there. And I also hang out at Patterson Golf Park as well as Pendleton. And, we, of course, we have that 995, all the balls you can hit right now, which is, uh, I can't believe. You know, Jim, the numbers are more than doubled at the range. Wow. And they were ready to choke me when I said, do this. And, they <laughs> <laughs> and all I did was whine the first two weeks. Oh, we're losing money. <laughs> and here's Tony Miller, Raven Golf Club. Tony, say hello to everybody. Golf club. Hello, everybody. Hello. And Raven's goal, I took this off your website there, is the world leader in custom golf clubs, partnering with top pros and club makers around the world. And, of course, you say you don't spend millions of dollars on marketing and tour players. Why don't you give me some of that money? I have. That's my problem. That's why I'm still working. <laughs> but, uh, you and the government, it's like, I don't know, it's my own social experiment. There you go. <laughs> don't talk about social right now. <laughs> anyway, we promise to give you some truthful information tonight that's going to put you at the advantage over your golfing buddies. And I mean, it's, it's really, really going to be good tonight. I'm telling you that right now. You wait and see. And we're going to email you the webinar. The recording's supposed to be working this time. Hold on. Somebody was trying to say something. Who was that? Well, never mind. We will open the mic so you can ask a question. You can always just click a little thing there to raise your hand, and I'll know that you want to ask a question. And we will fulfill our promise. Anybody who's new tonight will be happy to tell you about what our membership's all about. And, of course, with this wonderful technology we have at our hands right now, you can actually improve your game at home in your pajamas, which is what we're doing right now. Now we just want to know one thing. Hold on. Before we get started, let me go to James. Jim, is, uh, is Marika in her pajamas? No, no, I'm not. Okay. I, well, we'll I actually... Then we'll turn the camera off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, <laughs> Tony Miller, it's a pleasure to have you on tonight, buddy. I'm having a lot of fun, and we haven't even partly got started yet. Here we go. Now, you know, step one so that uh, everybody understands, and you haven't seen these slides yet, but we're going we're gonna to put you on the spot here as we go along. Good. Um, comparing, let's say, Callaway which I'm a Callaway staff player, and Jim, of course, is a pink staff player, and here you own Raven Golf Clubs. And you can see you have the funny screws around the golf club just like a tailor-made would. What, what's, sorry, what's the biggest really... difference? Because you've been on both sides of the, of, the, of the ledger. You worked for Wilson, right? 30 years ago, correct? 30 years. Woof. And uh, time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? And In then... Way, it doesn't seem as possible, does it? Yeah. So what, what, in your mind, is the biggest difference between the name brand club and something like what you design? Advertising, pros, salaries, et cetera, et cetera. Really? Yeah. The, the, um, when you're working in the golf industry, in general, you're not pushing your engineering degree to the maximum. I mean, we're not, we're not flying a spacecraft. We're... We're not working in nanotechnology. We're, we're not trying to 
cure cancer. You know, we're, we're not doing a lot of things that have a lot of worldly impact, but um, pros are paid to, pay to play things, and uh, the people think that automatically that's the right answer. Okay. But the quality of the actual head itself and everything you would say is, is goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the name brand or? Not everyone. Um, you know, there's there's always advantage takers in every industry. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. There's a, there's a fine line of difference between replication. There's a, there's a fine line between what would be considered counterfeiting and a fine line between um, a whole di different one, a series of names and numbers and you know, the big companies want to call it uh, knockoffs and they have a whole lot of terms to things and the reality is, is I think you can go in any industry, whether it's golf or what, whatever might float your boat today, but I think that most people would realize that most small companies are the innovators in the world and the big companies are not. And I don't think that's any secret to a whole lot of people. Um, the problem It I is to the president. <laughs> Are we starting this already? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is Timothy Geithner in here? Because I listened to him on like eight channels yesterday. Because I don't want to have him on another one. Okay. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> um, now you got me all shook up here. I don't even know what I... The, the reality is, is once the USGA says that you pass the COR test, and we all comply to the same, same statistics, the same rules, the same variations. Um, one head versus another is more similar than one might want to think. If you want okay. to deal with a Raven head, Callaway head, a TaylorMade head, any of the major brands, they're more similar than one would think. Um, if you're a smaller company and your heads are even talked about, you're probably doing something very good because you don't have the ad budget that a larger player in the industry has. So if you look at some of the smaller companies that have some people playing their products and are in play on a daily basis, I think you're doing great. Now you've mentioned the COR, so I, I did make a slide on that. Why don't you explain to the gang out there what, what COR means? COR is a pretty simple thing that it has a lot of fancy octosyllabic principles to it, but uh, the coefficient of restitution tells you that if a golf ball is sitting on a peg and you're swinging at 100 miles an hour, it just can't come off faster than a 0 .83 relationship. There has to be some energy loss that they're creating, and the number they created was 0 .83. Um, that number could be any number, but that happens to be the one they picked. Um, Taking, but ironically, taking a number much higher than 0.83 makes a golf head incredibly vulnerable to breaking. When you get up in the 0.86, 87 category, your golf club head has a very hard time keeping it together. So I, I really truly don't know if they picked the number because that's kind of the maximum number that we can safely keep a golf head from flying apart in play or if it's a number that had some mathematical relevance, which I've never been able to figure out where the, F, where, where the USGA came up with that number. Now, I thought that a, 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 a cannon, like, shoots the ball at 100 miles an hour against the face with the head in some kind of a vice, and it couldn't bounce back more than 83 miles an hour. Is that? Yeah, essentially that's what it is. And they have way okay. different ways. Today they're sonically testing it. They're, they're taste, testing it in way different ways than when they originally set the rules and made all the plans. So, I mean, being, a, being an engineer at, at Tang or Callaway or any company is, is kind of a moving target. Now, didn't they invent or somebody invented some kind of a little machine that could test COR at the first tee at a tournament? Yeah, to my knowledge, that machine was a guy that I, I dealt with when I was at Wilson. His name was Jim Shinola. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Jim was one of the, he's the guy that invented the fat shaft for Wilson. I love the fat shaft. Love the fat shaft. You know, the fat shaft was invented for a really interesting reason. 
the now, well, let, let's explain everybody what the fat shaft is, because the three of us are going to go off on a tangent here. If any of you remember the Wilson clubs when they started coming out with this shaft that had a larger diameter down at the tip, that's why they called it fat shaft. And I thought it did more for off-center hits than any of the cavity back um, perimeter-weighted promises made that, that are not true. Am I, am I close on that, Tony, or is it? You know, I think you're. I think you're dead on. I think that anybody that's ever tried one, what they did is, they, this was kind of an accident that happened. Back then, Wilson was primarily heading into the retail environment and less in the pro category of golf. You had the pro line category and you had mm -hmm. the retail category, and they wanted a golf club that they could play and went really far, flew really high, and went really straight. And the, what, what Jim came up with was, okay, well, let's reduce the torque of the shaft and increase the flexibility. But the only way you could do that was increasing the diameter of the metal. So they made a larger diameter. They could play it substantially more flexible. It felt stiffer because it was torsionally more stable. And these things just went incredibly high, incredibly straight, and were really easy to hit. Um, but like you know, many things in retail, they just have to keep changing them. But they still have fat shafts in their line. They've reduced the diameter, if I remember correctly, from 0.500 diameter to a somewhere on a 0 0.3, 0 0.38. It's so a little smaller, looks a little more normal. I think they think it fits a golfer's eye a little bit better than that original fat shaft. Well, my my understanding with the original fat shaft is, you know, where a shaft. For the folks out here that aren't club builders, you know, the shaft goes in the head and you put some glue around it and the shaft is hollow and um, the fat shaft was almost like a putter where out of the club was coming a, 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 you had a little post that came out of the neck of the golf club and the shaft went around that and it gave such a horrible feel when you hit it that in the later models they started putting a piece of rubber in there to sort of dampen that feeling, but it was too late. It already had a reputation of, of, of feeling horrible when you hit it. Imagine if you would hit that with an old top plate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so well, um, <laughs> here's something that was, I think, really great for the average golfer, for anybody. I think it still should be, to be very honest. And when they first came out, the shaft was actually internal in, in, the, in the hosel. Or what? But you know, when they did the product testing with all the consumers, imagine how fat that looked when you had a half-inch diameter shaft inside a hosel. It looked like a, just like it was huge. So then well, they put it on the outside, which is an over-hosel design, which if you want to go back to the old Ryder Club, Cup Clubs and the old PGA Golf out of Chicago from the 80s, they had all over-hosel designs, and they had a similar thought process. I mean, this isn't like it's new. They just took it to the next level. Well, I think you should pick your golf clubs like your girlfriends. Who cares if they're fat as long as they feel good? <laughs> oh, my God. My Sorry, Marika. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marika's nice and thin, but we don't want her to be like, let me see if we get her on the line. Marika. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the senior chief was laughing. You see that? You never know what's going to come out of the Cuban's mouth, right? <laughs> All right, Tony, let's keep going here. Like so, you had a ventriloquist. <laughs> now, the difference between cast and forged. I've got both your clubs up here, of which I have an experience if with your, uh, what are they called? Was it the MVT? Yes. Mm -hmm. That... I had some very good luck with this club head here. I thought it was uh, a little rounded in the sole, which helps the regular guy. You see right here, you see how rounded that is? It is rounded like that. But anyway, tell us what's the difference between the two. Well, in today's world, much less than it used to be. You know, when, when we all started playing golf, being as old as we are, everything was a forged golf club because we didn't have the capacity to cast a piece of metal accurately. So Ping was probably one of the original innovators of, of investment casting, and, and Carson did it in putters more than he did irons. 
uh, Wilson did it in the old days of the gear effect, the old GEs, and that, if you remember those clubs. Um, but a forged piece of metal is nothing more than if you can imagine something being pounded out by a bunch of hammers. An old blacksmith in a Scottish foundry was making these heads in the old days. Where, where when we get into a cast golf, here game, it is right there. Yep. Here's the forge process, and I've got some pictures here, and you I can see it. Tell me you're doing all this. You leave. You need a live human being to actually do the work, and that's that's part of the hang-up, is it not? Well, plus you need a series of dies. You you need a, you know you need somewhere between a half a dozen and nine dies per head to get it to a finished variety, and then you got to do a whole series of polishing to get this thing done. So the the manpower involved in this is huge. You know, the old Wilson Sporting Goods and, and Spalding and McGregor in the old days, they had rooms full of, you know, just wonderful people grinding golf clubs and making them perfect one set at a time before the days of mass production. But once you get to casting, you're, you're going to take a, a similar mold, but it's a la lost wax process, where it's you make a wax mold of a head. Do you have something on that one? That we're yes, I most certainly do, my friend. There you go. There we go. I had a suspicion you were ahead of me. And we take a piece of wax, like you have on the left there, and then you, you dip that in a whole series of slurries. And then when you're ready to go, you build them onto a big tree, which this is the beginning of it. That's tree. over here. This is this is like a tree. The whole set is on there, is it not? Well, that's probably all eight irons or nine irons. Or I got you. I got you. you you're right. You're right. You're not going to put a set in there. But if you look at the little white thing that's sticking out of there, right. that's actually wax. Mm -hmm. What will happen is when you build this on a tree, you then pour molten stainless steel into this mold, and anywhere there's wax, the wax melts, goes away, turns into carbon dioxide, and inside this little piece of sand, essentially, is a golf club head. And it, it, it cools off, and you bust them all off with a bunch of hammers, and then you crack off the sand, and what's left is a, is a golf club head that's got grooves in it and some basic logos in the back, and it only has to be polished to a very small amount. It may look very pretty, so you have very, very minimal effort being put into the finishing process, which is a very expensive part in today's world. And the fact that we can't hardly polish anything in America because OSHA doesn't let, let us do that in America anymore. Oh, don't get me started. Oh, come on. Let's go now. <laughs> well, like uh, Brian Clark was on the line here. He's got a set here. Let me put Brian. Brian. Yes. Oh, good. You got a microphone. You're on. The, you're on. You're on here with Jim Mason and uh, Tony Miller, and uh, he's got a set of McGregor's that he bought. Oh. That I guess McGregor was looking to try and um, make a a perimeter weighted forged head. To a, be attractive to a better player, and he goes, you know, McGregor was always trying to lean towards the better player instead of the, you know, the masses, and then and then they put a Nippon shaft, and there's got a Nippon 1150. Mm -hmm. And when I saw those, I went, wow, those are nice clubs. And you got them what on the internet for what? Uh, 264 set. Can you believe that? They probably McGregor probably had to just dump them or they dumped them on somebody, and they're selling them on the internet. Now, how old are they? Oh, uh, they're 2008 models. I've got them. I've had them about two years. And they're great know, clubs. I don't know what year it happened, but, you know, McGregor is not McGregor today. McGregor's owned by Golfsmith. Yes, Golfsmith. I, I thought that the, the Shark was trying to buy McGregor at one time or something. Well, Greg Norman. He was involved in him prior to Cobra. Yeah, he uncovered. He, he bought in a Cobra in the 80s. Yeah, but wasn't he trying to get McGregor, too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's a shame. Smith, uh, I guess, had more power being publicly traded than he had. Hard to believe. He's got plenty of dough. Well, Brian, you got a nice set of irons. And that's one thing we try to, Tony, pride ourselves on. We don't go to a student and say, you know what? Those things are a piece of junk. You ought to have this. You know, well, we, we try and tell them the truth. I think the one thing that, we're, that we haven't talked about 
and I know we have plenty of time here, but when we talk about golf clubs, the marketing directors of these major companies, especially TaylorMade in the last two years, has done a masterful job at eliminating the, the key to the whole play. They don't talk about shaft anymore. Now, those McGregors you bought have Nippon 1150s, you said? Correct. I mean, yes, Nippon correct. is one of the finest shaft makers in the world. I mean, Nippon is Japan, Japan shaft company. They have the capacity to make about a million steel shafts a year, which, to put it in perspective, um, that's a million shafts a year. True Temper can make 2.2 to 2.4 million per month. So, you know, they make some high-quality, great shafts. So not only do you have a really good golf club head with McGregor on it, you've got, you know, arguably one of the finest steel shafts made in the world. You see that? I told you. Yeah, it's good stuff. I was thinking about getting some uh, shafts for my wedges, too. Well, we can, get, we can get a Nippon 1150 and put it in there. I mean, that's... that's uh... That's not a problem, but I, I don't know why I like that. You know, they have that, that true temper GS95, Tony, that's a 95-gram shaft, and you have the Nippon 950. But I like the Nippon much better. It seems to kick a lot. There's just something about it. Well, I don't think that anybody would tell you that the, the Japanese manufacturers understudy anything. I mean, they, they overstudy things to the nth degree. So if they're releasing a good head or a good shaft in today's market, the odds are extremely good. It is wonderful. Plus they were offering free sushi with the shafts. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, if they ship it from Japan, it may not be safe anymore. I don't care. I'll eat it anyway. <laughs> it won't slow me down. Okay, so, so this, is the, this is the cast right here. Yeah. And now here's, here's my pet peeve. If it, uh, let me see if I can go back this. Whoops, I guess I got to go the, the other way. See, that's the big mistake they made, so let me handle it. You see this down here where it says misconception? This, to me, is the big lie that the golf club companies have put across only because, as you know, you go on your site at ravengolfclubs.com, right. and a typical cast head might cost, what, eight bucks? Yeah, eight nine bucks in today's world. Okay, and the forged head you have there was thirty eight bucks. Right. Okay, so um, nothing wrong with that. It's just no. the golf club companies realize that hey, there's a there's a figure people are willing to pay for a set of irons. Maybe it's eight ninety nine or seven ninety nine or whatever it is, and they've been able to con everybody into thinking, oh wow, well you know you should have this cavity back thing. And they're easier to hit, and they've got forgiveness, which I think is a bunch of hooey. You may argue with me on that, but um, because they wanted to get away from having to make a forged club because it costs them too much money, the margins aren't there. So well, they'll I say stuff like forged clubs are of higher quality metal, and they are harder to use. And, of course, they are more expensive than cast clubs. The more forgiving cast irons, that is a crock of manure. Well, I think those are two, you know, you, you've raised two completely different topics, or three probably there. One was price. I will tell you that if you if you make a standard forged head, right. you don't make it with a lot of milling and a lot of marking and a lot of logos, they're not that much more expensive than a cast club. Really? In world, yeah. You'd be surprised, actually, to make a forging prior to the hand grinding and the stamping and the chrome plating, it's actually less expensive for the blank itself than a cast head is. Um, where you get into it is the finishing. But the first thing that's happened in the forge marketplace is the majority of forgings in the old days, back when Wilson, Ram, McGregor, Spalding, you know, when these guys ran the golf business, which was 20 years ago, all these forgings were coming out of a place in Chicago or Nashville that named the Hoffman Forge. They all came from the same place, within reason. There were a couple different, Ken Smith got some from Hoffman, there were a couple other small ones, so they all came from the, the same place. The, the art and the magic came in, you know, the craftsmen that were grinding these things. But the second thing you were talking about in this cast thing, 
the things that you can do in a cast golf club today where we're creating undercut designs if you look at the new Taylor now what's an undercut design an undercut when you look at that old MVF can you go back to yes hold on okay now that club's five years old and if you look there at you the go. back of the MVF on the right you mm -hmm. see how I already started wrapping the back up, up, up the back we're raising the center of gravity, putting it right back behind the ball. Mm -hmm. You look at the new Tour Edge, the new Rocket Balls, the new pens, they're all bringing that back cavity up. Callaway was one of the, you know, they did it right after me. Um, but we all can measure the dynamics of this thing. We can make this head curve. In a casting, you can't do that in a forging because you've got to hammer this thing and you'd have to make it in two pieces and weld it together. In a casting, we can, we can put it... Now, when you say two pieces, the neck is actually put on second, is it not? No, that's a third piece if we have a third. That's, that, that's a whole other design. If you can imagine the front face being one piece, right. the back cavity being a second piece, and you welded those together, okay. that's how you'd make a forged with an undercut design because unless you're going to reach inside of it with a machine tool like my 401s where you machine all that material out of there that's why our heads get expensive because we're reaching in there with a CNC machine tool and we're going to mill all that material out of there in a forging okay so 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 that so that the folks listening can catch on to this in other words you're talking about going inside this club head and taking metal out of the inside of it Go one to the right and imagine that that was flat back and we had to dig all that metal out of there. Right. We have to do it by casting it or we got to bring it, bring in a machine that's going to cut all that out of there. So if it was forged, we'd have to cut that all out of there. That's why the prices start going up. To make a forged cavity bag. Yes. So the McGregor cavity bag that Brian has, they had to dig all that out of there. Well, there's two ways to do that. They can forge it in two pieces or three pieces and weld them together. Uh huh. They can also machine it out, which is a second option. A third option is what I do. We do what's called near net processing, meaning we cast the head out of a forged material, a 1025, an 8620, an 8630. And then what we do is we come back and we hydrostatically press these heads to give it the forged quality that you would get from pounding it out like an old blacksmith. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, I don't have as much finishing. That's why originally my older forged heads, my 201s and some of these, were not a whole lot more money than a cast head. These companies have the capacity to make much less expensive forgings if they wanted to. They choose not to. Uh-huh. And I don't know why, other than there are very few people still forging heads. Now, how many places can you go to, if you wanted to make a golf club today, where on this planet would you have to go? Well, in Japan, you still have, you have Mira, you have Kyogi, you have Mizuno, um, those are probably the only three that I am sure are still open in Japan. There might be a couple more, and I, I apologize if I've missed one, maybe Vega. Otherwise, even the Japanese forging houses have gone to mainland China, and we used to be able to find a whole bunch of people who could do that, but as soon as the major golf companies closed down their U.S. manufacturing and moved it to China, they bought up all the capacity. So that capacity, even for forgings and casting, has diminished since the Callaways and the Pings and the TaylorMades have all moved to China. If that makes sense. I mean, they just they bought up the capacity. Now, what about the fact that a lot of people think that in the same factory, the name brand and, for lack of a better term, the knockoff, but in your case, I would say custom design, um, are made in the same under the same roof. Used to always be the case. In today's world, it's not the case, and I'll explain the difference. In the old days, meaning pre 
pre-2000, pre-1995, somewhere in that category. If you went back to about 1995, Callaway Golf was still casting heads somewhere in America, bringing them to California, finishing them, and working them up. Ping still does a little bit, not as much as they used to, but they still do some casting domestically and, and finishing in Phoenix or down in Mexico. Um, but many of the companies still manufactured parts of their products domestically. Lynx was made up in Toronto, if you remember the old Lynx when it was... Yeah, I, I played golf with that guy that owned Lynx when they first yeah, started. Yeah, not Toronto. I forget his name yeah. now. I gotta, I'm digging uh, way too deep into the archives here, buddy. Um, he came out to Spain when I was out there. Really? Yeah, and I played golf with... But I never liked those Lynx clubs. I thought they were horrible. Well, I thought they had design problems, but their casting was quite good. It was. It tells you how much I know. That was a long time ago, back when that was still. That was early '90s, I'll bet. Don't you think? No, I'm. T well, no, when I played golf with this guy, this was 1974. Oh, way in the beginning. Yeah. Yes. That was th that we were barely able to make them back then. Yeah. Yeah, he was an early onset guy, and I and I I'm. Struggling to come up with his name here. Sorry about that. Um, if I think of it, if I blurt out a name and tell you it's from Toronto, you'll know that that's who it is. But it doesn't matter. Um, back back to my thought process. In, in that time period, we made things in America. So there was only a handful of major manufacturers originally in Taiwan. Then the Taiwanese couldn't make it cheap enough, so they went to China. So when I was going over there, whether I was working for Raven or Wilson or, or back when I was with Kenneth Smith or, or, or back in these days, you'd go into places, they were making heads for Cobra, they're making heads for TaylorMade, they're making heads for Kenneth Smith. Today, when Callaway goes over there, they form a joint venture with the Chinese government and a manufacturing subsidiary, and they build a building in Guangdong Province, we'll call it, and they and the side of the building it says Callaway Golf and everybody in the inside is wearing white jumpsuits and it says Callaway Golf on their back and they all work for Callaway. But that that's like ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, when all these guys sold out of California or Chicago or Boston and headed to China for cheap manufacturing dollars. That makes sense? Yeah, and what about the quality? I would say that I. You want the honest thing? I mean, I, I got to be careful because there's a lot of brands that I was involved with. I can tell you that in my heyday overseas, Cobra Golf, when they were owned by Norman, paid more than anybody else for heads. I don't think that's the case anymore, but but back in back in that vintage when he was when Cobra was just really starting to boom when it was still owned by Greg Norman, they just literally outbought everybody in Asia and they got what I would consider probably the highest quality heads because they just outpaid. Mm -hmm. The other guys that wanted them for two dollars cheaper, I don't think there's any secrets that they were one not getting them as quickly and two not getting the same quality. Now today I think that's very different. But that's that's what was going on back then in the in the nineties. Hmm. Okay, let's move on to some next stuff here. Now This is really boring to a lot of people probably. The shaft. Yes. You mentioned that somebody earlier wasn't even talking shaft. Who was that you said or can you remember? Taylor made. Taylor made, right. They weren't talking shaft. And I've got an example here, steel versus Graphite, does the shaft make a difference, and if so, how? You're asking me the question again? No, I'm asking the man in the moon. Well, I, <laughs> I can't see if the man in the moon's listening. But I, I, I learned all this at Dale Carnegie, how to make people feel better about themselves. He just know? died, didn't he? <laughs> no, that's no, Ziggy Ziggler. He's only a week dead, and you're already abused. Ziggy Ziggler, Ziggy Ziggler dropped dead, not uh, oh, Dale sorry, Carnegie. Oh, whatever. They all eh, it's the same thing. What's the difference? I've been to all of them. All right. Um, Did you I, walk on the rocks with Tony, uh, Tony, what's his name? No. Tony no, Robbins. Tony Robbins, you got to walk on the hot rocks, right? 
Yeah, and I, and I stay out of those hot huts in Arizona when it's 120 outside, too. <laughs> All uh, right, so in, tell us. In my, in my estimation, I would call the shaft the most important piece of the puzzle. I think that if, but when we design ahead and we're limited to a handful of metals because we only have certain weight properties we can deal with, if anybody thinks that the designers at Ping or the 64 design engineers that they have at Callaway or me or Wilson or somebody else, if they think that this stresses our engineering aptitude, they'd be sorely misled. Um, today's with um, rapid prototyping, the computers we have access to, uh, we all make very good products. The difference is, is the big companies have purchasing departments that their engineers say, I want a shaft that does X, and their purchasing departments goes to the shaft manufacturers in, in China and says, I want a shaft that does X, but I only want to I only want to pay three dollars and I think that when you talked before about the GS 95 from true temper which mm -hmm. is pick up the internet it's gonna sell for about eighteen dollars and fifty cents right try to buy that Nippon 1150 I would imagine if you went on eBay you'd pay what twenty five thirty dollars for that one yeah I was just gonna say twenty three twenty four bucks I mean if you were buying a golf works or something like that yeah, so, I mean, is there a difference between a $23 Nippon shaft or an $18.50 True Temper GS95 made in Memphis, Tennessee versus a $1.85 steel shaft that has the weight, but it's made in Nandong, China? Are they the same? I don't think they're remotely the same, personally, and I've tested them and I've tried them. I, I personally think the magic is, is the shaft. I think that whether you're TaylorMade or Raven or Pang or, or anybody, um, head design is much closer than one would think, especially with all the new rules the USJ has put on us. We just can't have much differences anymore. But the shaft is magic. You know, I mean, I think most golfers have hit that 1-8 iron that they, they just they hit it better than any golf club in their bag, and they never sat down to think, wow, if I could figure out why that shaft feels better than all the rest of my clubs, why don't I try to get all the rest of the clubs to feel the same? And if they took that club to Bobby Lopez, you'd say what? You'd say, let's frequency that club and find out the weight, the frequency, and let's tune it, and let's find out Let's go get eight more shafts, duplicate that shaft, and you'd have a whole set of clubs that feel the same and play the same. Now, why don't you tell everyone about frequency, a, a, a shaft frequency? Okay, frequency is a, is a simple term invented by the Brunswick Company originally. Dr. Braley invented it, um, I would guess, in the early 80s. And frequency is an electronic measurement. Uh, we've all had it if you've had physics class, and the frequency is a square root of the stiffness. So we're doing nothing more than measuring the stiffness of the golf shaft electronically. So if in the old days a guy had a Ram driver that said this was a 255 driver, that meant that it oscillated 255 times per minute, and that told us the stiffness. And another was a 245 and a 265 and a 275. In today's world, they call that frequency matching. And most people would think to Rifle or a company like that. And they would say, I play Project X50s, 55s. And what that meant originally was that was a slope, which we don't have a chart for this, but we can come back at a different day. Yeah, you know, I should have put that up there. We'll, do, we'll add that back. There's a frequency is measured length versus the stiffness. And I think all of us understand that our 9 iron is shorter than our driver. So our 9 iron feels mechanically stiffer when you try to twist it or bend it than a driver does. Well, there's a. There's a I'm going to try and find this one while you're talking. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's tons of frequency matching charts out there. 
um, what we're measuring is shafts move typically in half inch differentials. Uh, so a 8 iron, 9 iron, 7 iron, 6 iron, 5 iron move in about 4.5 to 5 cycles per half an inch ele electronically to match. If you took a standard set of clubs to a golf shop that had a frequency machine, they would probably vary plus or minus three to four flexes because the frequencies would be so off in today's world. Uh, in the old days, frequencies, there you are. That's there it. you go. That's it. If you look at, you've got length on one axis, right or left. I'm sorry, length is on the bottom. Right here in the bottom, 42 inches, 41 inches, 40 inches, etc. Right. And All the way across. The average wedge is 35 and a half inches. So if you go up to that chart, a, a wedge that's stiff is going to be, say, 320 cycles per minute. Um, if you measured a tour player's set of golf clubs, his clubs would fall perfectly on one of those lines. The blue one, the black one, the red one, the green one. That's if they're built on the idea of the 4.3 cycles per club that Brunswick came up with. Yeah, but I think... Well, what about Griffiths and all those other guys? You know, they built stuff with all kinds of weirdo, you know, like weakening the 3 and 4 iron to make it easier to hit and make stiffening the 8 and 9. What about single frequency and that garbage, which I don't well, believe in. really but... technical right now. What we used to call them Henry Misfits. You're talking about... <laughs> Come on, Pitch man. One thing and build you another set. Um, yeah, you're exactly correct. I mean, the bottom line is the majority of people fade their three iron, four iron, maybe a five iron. So if you make it a little bit stiffer, it, it closes itself at impact slightly quicker, and it will automatically hit the ball less to the right if you're a right-handed player or less cut. Um, you know, I can take a, a halfway decent player. And by changing the frequency of their clubs, I can make a golf ball go right or go left, and they won't know why we did that. But tour players have all those beautiful vans. If they want a ball to, to curve two feet right, two yards left, they can go to the van and change the frequency of a shaft by one or two points. And many times that's all it takes for them to get exactly that little cut or the little hook they're looking for. Almost like bowlers where they're carrying like eight, ten balls to the lane. Yeah, they're all different hardnesses, different consistencies, different, yeah, exactly. I mean, bowlers, what, what does a bowling ball last today? Months for good bowlers, right? Well, let's, let's ask uh, Gene here. He's a real good bowler. Gene. Yes. What, how long does a ball last for you guys? Well, I can't speak for it because I was a once-a-week bowler for only... 20 weeks of the season, but the guys that are bowling every day, those, you know, hundreds and hundreds of frames, I, I think a month is the time frame. You're probably right. It's a soft cover, so it wears down very quickly. And they're made out of urethane, just like the new golf balls are. You know, what do you think of the new golf balls? I think the new golf balls have been a tremendous detriment to the average golfer. Okay, how so? Um, golf balls, when the Pro V1 was designed, were designed to not spin much on a driver and to spin a lot on an iron. Right. And they're not wound like rubber. These are, these are just injection molded pieces of either rubber or urethane. But the covers on these golf balls are ultra-thin urethane on the outside. And this urethane is to control the spin for good players, guys like Bobby Lopez. So when you hate your golf game, blame it on your teachers, because they're the golf. <laughs> they always do. Yeah. You didn't tell me to do that. But, it, but it, if you look at a Pro V1, it's designed to play for a, 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 a kid or a player who's generating 160-ish miles per hour ball speed is when it becomes its Ferrari self. And the rest of us that play Pro V1s, we lose distance off the tee because we can't compress it and we make it spin too much. You have to hit that ball really hard so that urethane doesn't allow a spin. Um, so too much spin, which we've all read about, 
you know, causes a lot of crazy problems for the average day-to-day -day golfer. All right, and, that, that makes sense. I mean, you know, so when you, you keep going, you know, product to product, we were on shafts, we went to golf balls, but, you know, finding the right golf ball and finding the right shaft, in my estimation, has more impact on the average golfer than any two things. Shaft first, golf ball second. I always say get a golf ball you can afford and stick with it so you get used to how it performs. You can't keep switching balls all the time. And good ones that fit your game don't have to cost a lot of money. I mean, no. a lot of people should play things like those, you know, laddies or lady golf balls or the Strix on 333s or, you know, these are relatively inexpensive golf balls and they fit way more average players than the Pro V1s of the world. Yeah, like Jim, you've got you've got what the pinnacles as well as the Titleist. I mean, you got like six or seven different kinds of Titleist there, don't you? Yeah, we do, and and I agree 100 percent. You know, you don't need to spend the money on those Pro V ones; they're really not worth it. Well, you know, depending on the platform. Mean, if you're if you're you know playing VSGA tournaments and you're in this in the scratch flight, you know, and 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 you know, you're the kind of guy who can shoot 68 a lot. I mean, yeah, okay, maybe, but. Now, what about the lighter driver, which I have up here now? That's the new craze, you know, that I yeah, guess Pete, Cleveland got it started. Tell us whether that really has any merit or whether it's a bunch of malarkey. Well, you remember Cal Pete. It all goes back to, what, 78 when he played him? Calvin Pete? Now, I used to play a lot with Calvin Pete. Remember, and he, he, and he had a steel shaft to driver. There's no way that thing was light because we yeah, had steel. He iron shafts. He was the first super light guy that played the game. Yeah, but that might have been once he got on the road. Ah, uh, maybe. Yeah, when, uh, we, when we used to play, it's because we used to go to Hollybrook, which was a golf course over there in, in Fort Lauderdale. Johnny Lapanzina was the pro there. And, and we, we'd go because we, we gambled. <laughs> Not you. That was the whole idea. We played for money, see. And uh, they used to they put in the PGA thing one time about how Calvin Pete, poor Calvin Pete, was so poor from a poor family. He had to hit balls on the school field. Well, I used to hit balls on that school field with him. It was over on Sheridan Avenue in Fort Lauderdale. We went to the school field to hit balls because we didn't want anybody to see us practicing over at Hollywood. So we'd go hit balls in the morning in the field. We'd practice, and then we'd go over there around one o'clock, is when all the games would hit. You know, and you know, we'd play fifty, hundred dollar Nassau's, and we'd make some money. Is that what they called hustling in the old days? Oh come on, now you wouldn't think a Cuban would hustle. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean getting there quickly. I meant hustling in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, but that's that sort of helped me. You know, all through, because when you get the experience of playing for money that's in your pocket, then when you get what out... What was Lee famous line? What was that? Pressure is playing a $15 Nassau when you get two bucks in your pocket? Yeah, I've done that plenty of times. <laughs> plenty of times. I used to, I used to uh, play um, the guys that used to work at, the, at Miami International Airport. And they would be the baggage guys. They could all play pretty good. They could shoot 38, you know, 37, 39 on nine holes. And I'd run from school because I got off just about the same time. I'd run over there, and I'd get on the golf course with them, and I'd win 40, 60 bucks there. And then I'd go to putt-putt at night <laughs> and make Losing. some money at putt-putt. <laughs> so while the rest of the kids were making a buck 35 an hour at Burger King, I was killing it. <laughs> but it was fun. Anyway. These light drivers, what do you, what do you think of this? All right, here's the math. Mathematically, they claim, you know, when I say they, when you, when you take all the designers that are working on all these computers, right. they're going to tell you that a 46-inch driver with a 40-gram shaft, I'm sorry, 45-gram shaft, a 30-gram grip, 185-gram head, it's the ball further than any other possible driver. That's the math of a driver. Hold on, 185 head. Which one of your heads is? What? Which head is yours? It's 185. Uh, the 4200 comes out at 185 with no weights in it. Okay, with no weights uh, in it. Before you put the screws in it, so you, you'd have to put super light screws. That's the math. Um, I don't buy it. I think that. Um, 
if the 45 gram shafts and these ultra lightweight drivers were the answer, don't you think every tour player would play it? And I don't know one tour player that doesn't play heavy graphite. Well, you know, the thing is, when you look at rhythm and tempo, and you know, you get all of a sudden this one light club in your bag that doesn't resemble anything else in your bag. Bingo. That's my feeling. As as uh, you know, what do I you agree. think, Jim? The other thing is, is if, yeah. unless you have a super smooth tempo, who can swing something that weighs a feather, and it's forty six inches long, and go from backwards to forwards easily? When well, look, if you're going to if you're going to swing with all this super rhythm, who needs the lighter club? Yeah, you're already good. I mean, if I got a lighter club, I'm going to knock the snot out of it. It weighs a ton. Yeah, uh, I, I think that it's a I think that if it helps a senior hit the ball further and golf is fun, God bless you keep doing it. Um, but I also think that if you're a senior and you're 85 years old and, and you're living in Naples and you need to hit a 52-inch driver, disregard everything the USGA says, go get a 52-inch driver and go have fun at Naples National and don't worry about what these guys are telling you. <laughs> well, having fun. well, let's ask you one last question and we're done here. Center of gravity on the golf club. All these golf club companies talk about bigger sweet spot, bigger sweet spot. Give us the truth. Um, yeah, they, they are bigger sweet spots today. Um, that came from a term, if you, about three, four years ago, uh, there was a square driver that came out originally by Nike. Mm -hmm. If you remember the old square driver theory, it sounded, you know, you had to give your plugs out when you sold it because it sounded so bad. Right. Um, they pitched that driver on what was called moment of inertia or MOI. Right. Once they came out with that, then the USJ and their innumerable genius came back and said, oh, we've got to limit moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is nothing more than spreading the weight on the perimeter of a golf club to counterbalance it. So if you take a square, if I hit it on the toe, there's a counterbalance on the square towards the heel. So it can't twist as easily. Are you talking about like that, that square headed Callaway head? Yeah. Right. All we did by raising the moment of inertia, they did originally with squares, then we did it with screws in the head. You know, we, we called it adjustability, but what we really did was move weight to the perimeter of the golf club. By moving weight to the perimeter of a golf club, if you look at the original tailor-mades with two weights on the, on the back corners, that's kind of a square driver without putting the weight on the square, right? They just moved the weight in a half an inch. But they did the same thing. They increased the moment of inertia. But do, do you decrease the performance when you hit it in the center of gravity, though? No, you don't. What you do is you, you enlarge the sweet spot because off-center hits don't twist the shaft quite as much. That's why I like the fat shaft. Exactly. That did even a better job. Why do you think all the manufacturers are going to 350 diameter shafts in their drivers? So everybody knows, uh, uh, well, tell them what the difference between 350 and, and, and the, the 335. The shaft for zillions of years was 0.335 diameter of an inch. Almost all the majors, Taylor, Callaway, Adams, uh, Exotics, all the new drivers today are 0.350 and they increase the diameter for two reasons. One, to reduce breakage. Two, to increase the, 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 to reduce the effect of this really big piece of titanium hanging off the end of it, which wants to make that twist on off-center hits. Hold on, I've got the, uh, let me open up another one here. And that's, uh, We're looking right here at, hold on, hold on. Where is it? Why didn't it open? I've got some oh. picture. Hold on here. Oh, well, I thought I, I thought I still had that. I didn't. Sorry about that. That's what it goes back to. 
guys is, is if, if you remember those square heads, that was only meant to increase the, the sweet spot. The sweet spot is bigger today because the moment of inertia is larger, which allows us to make a thin face a little bigger. Oh, We've wait a minute. Done what's called a here it is. Here it is right here. Here's your moment of inertia thing. Uh, Where if the ball hits out near the toe, it kicks back. So if the diameter of the shaft is larger and can resist that kicking back effect. Yes. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Yep. That's one of the characteristics that you want to deal with. This one here, you're talking about gear effect. That's in the old clubs where we used to have curved faces. Right. We went over that last week. Yeah, the curved faces cause a little more gear effect, but it but it essentially does the same thing. The heads are just so much bigger today. You've got to you've got to have another way to counterbalance an off center hit because the average person can't deliver the golf ball in the center all the time. You know, a tour pro or a Bobby Lopez, they never miss the center of gravity. Or the center of the club, though, with the hitting off the parking lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> you haven't hung around me often. Now, tell them the whole story about how we met on, in the PGA show in Orlando. No, we don't have that much time left. We'd have to have a whole show just to that. But I will say that um, you're the only guy that I've ever seen hit a 400cc titanium driver off an a a asphalt parking lot peered at about 265 into another parking lot and didn't even set up a car alarm. <laughs> that was funny. Just I, picked it clean off the asphalt. Jim, what happened was he had a driver. I said, well, can I try it? I wanted to try a new driver. So I put a ball down on the on the parking lot, and I hit it right off the parking lot. <laughs> you hit it off the deck, not off a tee? Off the deck <laughs> into the buildings. <laughs> Oh my God. We didn't I hear any windows break. Had a show at the, I was a driver that was destined for the PGA show the next year, the next morning, which unfortunately left a little asphalt residue on the bottom <laughs> of the ball. <laughs> All right, let's open it up to questioning real quick before we close here. Anybody got any questions for Tony? Did you learn something tonight? Just raise your hand. Tell me you got a question. Dip will come up here in a second. How about you, Brian? You got a question? No, I don't. But make I'm one up, will you? Make one up. <laughs> go, back, go back to my uh, wedges. Yes. I put the uh, the eleven fifties in them. Mm -hmm. Would that, that make them as, as more consistent to what I'm already hitting, or would that matter? Go ahead, Tony. What's in them now? What shafts are in your wedges? I think he's got S three hundreds or something like that. Because the wedges are not McGregor's, are they? Not where? What, what are the wedges from? Cleveland. Cleveland, yes. Yeah, so it's got an S300 in there. You have S300s, to be very honest. I think that uh, that's as good a wedge shaft as there is on the market. It wouldn't hurt to try the 1150s, but the the dynamic gold S300 weighs about 130 grams, where yours, the ones you have, is 115 grams, i.e. Right. I, I the number on the shaft. Um, but wedges is... You know, that's that club you kind of pound down into the ground where a little weight's not a bad thing, but it's but it's a, it's an experiment that's very inexpensive to try. You can put a shaft in and see if you like it and if it helps. If it helps, do it. And if it doesn't, put the dynamic gold back in. I've yeah. got the technology. Well, I would I would say the only the only thing I think is worth doing is maybe something like a gap wedge, a fifty two degree wedge that you're gonna hit hundred and ten yards. Then it might be worth matching that up, but the sand wedge or a lob wedge, I wouldn't bother with it. No, because you're not hitting that for a dead-on distance very often. Right. Yeah. Thank you. How about Gene? Gene's got a question here. Hey, Gene. Hey, I was wondering what factors should I use to decide whether I wanted to get graphite or steel shafts in my irons or my driver? Find your best pro that you know in the area and, and have them go with you to hit a bunch of the shafts and try them both. I'm not a big fan of the graphite shaft and the irons. Unless you have a physical ailment. Right. Or or you got a pocket full of money and you can spend a lot. Now, what's the name of that? What is it? Acu uh, Aerotech or something? There's a shaft that Nicholas was crazy Aerotech about. that's are part steel, part graphite. Right. Um, it's a steel winding. Yeah, they're supposed to be good. There's a couple tour players fiddling with them. 
Um, you know, I'm a fairly big proponent of Grumman iron shafts. I think that they're affordable, uh, technically extremely sound. Uh, but there's some good ones out there. Um, if you decide to go into graphite iron shafts, I would highly recommend finding a shaft that you can frequency match. The consistency of graphite is nowhere near the consistency of steel. So you need to find a, a club builder like a, you know, Bobby knows what, what they're doing, where you can frequency and make sure that you, you match the whole set. Because graphite does not have the, the consistency that a piece of steel does. Yeah, and you won't necessarily get that from a major manufacturer either, will you, Tony? They're not going to go through that trouble. Absolutely will not, unless yeah. you can find a company that's going to make it in their custom department. See, I would much rather, Gene, if you were going to go which I've done the last four sets that I've sold with uh, Cal, I just say get get the get a lightweight steel shaft and don't worry. I mean, it's only ten grams difference between that and the graphite. Well, they make graphite. Or they, we make steel all the way down to seventy-five grams today, which is the way to graphite. Well, yeah, but I mean, a graphite iron is going to be at least eighty-five grams, is it not? I'm sorry. Uh, once you have a decent graphite shaft for irons, isn't it going to be eighty-five grams and higher? No, oh, I think you can get 75s that are pretty good. Yeah, you, know, you can I, break them. <laughs> well, you can. There's no doubt. I mean, they're 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 more they're more fragile. There's no question. Let's go to Tony here. He's got a question. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, yeah the new rocket blades, irons. Is the speed slot slot an innovation or is it a gimmick? Well, it's an undercut design, similar to other people's undercut. They're just weighting it a little bit differently, but it's the same technology. I think they've done a really nice job. I think it looks wonderful. I saw a set today in a shop, and I, I think that um, the cosmetics are good. I think what Bobby said in the very beginning when he challenged somebody to say that you, you play better with a cast club or a forge club, I would challenge anybody to think of their five best rounds and their five worst rounds that they played in their lifetime and I think that the irons that you have in your hand at the time has less impact than people might think. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that my best day with a blade I scored much better or worse than my best day with a cast club. I think when you're playing well, your timing's on, your tempo's on, you could play with almost anything and play it well. I think cast cavity back clubs win, or a rocket balls type club win on a day when you're not swinging well. Does that help anything? What kind of clubs do you have out there in New Zealand? Are they different than what we have, or is it? I mean, do you see a lot of Australian blade kind of stuff? Is it still around there? Uh, it's exactly the same as in the states. Really. Yeah. I used to love those Australian blades, man. Those guys used to have, I mean, I'm talking about back in the 70s. They were yeah, killer. Yeah, Carnegie Clark. Excuse me? Carnegie Clark. Remember them? They used Ooh. to make them. Carnegie Clark. They were a big name in Australia. Really? Yeah. But no, all the major manufacturers have representation there. You were still stealing cars in Havana back then, dude. <laughs> <laughs> How do they have golf courses in Havana, Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go to Bill Wagner here. He's got a question. Hey, Bill, we got Tony Miller on the line. You said some good things about the fat shaft, and I thought he said that Wilson still has some in line. Why don't we uh, have more fat shafts available? Why, why can't we use them more? Well, I tried to get a hold of the Wilson rep at one time, and he came out. I tried to convince Ricky at the driving range to buy the Wilson range ball. That Wilson range ball was absolutely fantastic. It was even better than the tour range. See, Spalding had the top flight uh, super range and the tour range. The tour range is far more expensive than the super range. The insider secret between us is that I really lobbied hard with Ricky, and she's She's very, she's very good at reinvesting money back in the range, as you can see. She's put the little brick stuff, and she spends a lot of money on the grass. And I told her, I said, listen, we've got to give the guys a good ball to hit. They've got to have a good ball. And that tour range is pretty good, but the Wilson ball, man, it was dynamite. 
And then you know what else they did, Tony? Uh, have you seen that new club they have that's graphite up near the grip and steel at the bottom? Sure have. Now, remember Charlie Adams came out with the, in the Adams Golf Club that had a graphite tip down at the bottom about two inches long, and the rest of the shaft was steel. Remember that? I sure do. It was the opposite of what True Temper was pitching at the time. Right. The real thing is the feel in the hands. So when you hit these new Wilson clubs where the, the graphite is up near the hands and the steel's down at the bottom, my own, if you put... If you put the fat shaft down at the bottom in steel and you had graphite from around halfway up or maybe a third of the way from the far end of the club, you know, the, the grip end, a third of the way down graphite and the rest of it steel with a fat shaft at the bottom, I think you'd have the ideal golf club. It would feel dynamite and it would you know, be very stable in the club, head. I don't know if you hit that golf club, but that golf club was actually designed by the De Marini bat people. If you know Wilson and baseball, they own a bat company called D Marini, which is like the bat in the world, you know, that all the great high school and college players play. And they took the same technology in their baseball bat, they put it in a golf club. They just neglected one thing, ad dollars. If they would have put a couple dollars behind that where people would have gone out and tried it, I suspect it would have been phenomenal. Because the technology is really, really solid. Well, I, I agree with you there. I mean, I couldn't believe, Jim, you wouldn't believe how good this thing felt. And then the, the Wilson rep disappeared. I mean, Wilson's in the toilet so bad that they can't get anybody to work for him. They've taken That's all the reps off the market, including all their independents. They only have like nine salesmen in the whole country. Really? Yeah. They've gone back big box because they opted to back out of this money exchange that you know Nike's doing right now. Right, and they're they're just not going to play, so they they said, hey, our name is still solid, and they're going to go back big box, and you know you can find their clubs in Sam's and Walmart and all over the place, and uh, they're just going to sit back and let the rest of these guys eat each other until they they quit playing so nasty. Oh, yeah, they're all right, a dirty game right now of publicly traded golf. Does that answer your question, Bill? Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. Not a problem, partner. Well, gang, I hope you enjoyed it tonight. Tony, I cannot thank you enough for spending your evening with us. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I learned a lot. Jim, what do you think? Did you oh, learn something tonight? It was great. I really appreciate it, Tony. That was very interesting. Well, thanks. Bobby always likes to blow a little smoke, so he probably doesn't really think it's important. But <laughs> Well, you see, that's what, what Jim says. What Jim says, oh, that's very interesting. You... <laughs> <laughs> You already know that's so I'll shut that guy up. Don't bring him here again. <laughs> Don't bring Tony Miller back again. He's no. show. <laughs> Maybe we'll see you down at the PGA show this year. I don't know. Jim, we ought to go, uh, man. Are you going? I'd like uh, to go. We should go, yeah. Maybe Jim and I can get some Puerto Rican to pull us on a little cart all the way down there or something. We can stay in a tent. <laughs> no, you should just hire him to drive you around. They have those things that they drive around the yeah. convention center in now. Yeah, the rickshaws. You could put, put your logo on the side. You could write it off as advertising. The last time we were there, I was walking around with Divot the Clown. <laughs> you met him? Yeah, that was the year after that we hit golf balls off the parking lot and I had to show my golf he, He's a, No, he's a nice guy. I can't remember his name now. He's left-handed. Nice kid. Divot the Clown does a trick shot show, you know. So uh, what can I tell you? Well, Tony... Really enjoyed it, buddy. I'm going to send you a copy of this so you'll have this. I don't know what for, but you'll have it anyway. My memoirs. And I hope everybody enjoyed this evening as much as we did. Jim? Have a great holiday, everybody. All right, Thank partner. You, See you next week.